So it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month at the time that this episode airs. And never before has Breast Cancer Awareness Month actually meant so much to me as it does this year. And this is because at the beginning of this year, I found a large lump in my right breast. And it really just floored me because number one, I really have never worried about breast cancer. Never once has it crossed my mind that I am going to go from breast cancer or that I would ever have it. We have no history of it in my family. It's just not, it's never been on my radar. And then lo and behold, I've got this great big lump. So I, you know, I call my doctor. She sets me up with a mammogram. I go for the mammogram and sit there and wait. And I get this call from the hospital and they say, we need you to come in now for a biopsy. So then I'm like, oh, well, what did they find? And I said, well, can you tell me more? And she said, it just says here that, yes, there's a cyst, but you've got to come in for a biopsy now. So on I go, go to the hospital, waiting in the room for the surgeon to come in. And she comes in and I say, you know, I think that this is just a cyst. I said, I swear it's gotten much smaller since it's when it first started. And I'm telling her this whole story. And then she's like, oh, Karen, you're not here because of your cyst. You're right. That is a cyst, but they actually found a lesion behind your nipple. So you can imagine how I was like, what? She's like, your doctor should have told you that. And so I'm thinking, oh my goodness, like, what are the chances I'd go for a mammogram because of a cyst? And then now they find a lesion. This is clearly going to be cancer because it's all meant to have happened this way. And I'm just freaked myself right out. The biopsy was the most horrific experience. I hated that. Went home, sat there, I think going for about a week, I went through all of the conversations I was going to have with my family, my children. I had just heard about um, a friend of mine, was my daughter's best friend's mom. So she wasn't my friend, but an acquaintance who had just died of breast cancer. So I just had all of these things running through my head that I'm going to have to leave my children, that I'm going to die, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, I get a text from my doctor that says, you are cancer free. It was not cancer. It was benign. So I then was on a mission to find out more about breast cancer because it happened so fast to me that I didn't, I I had heard things like you shouldn't get a mammogram because that can make it worse. And I didn't, I just didn't even know what to do. And I didn't have time to do my typical dive into the research, right. To see the natural stuff of side of things. So on my search on the internet, I came across an interview with Susan Wadia Els. Hopefully I've said that right, Susan. <laughs> and she was on with Dr. Mercola, Mercola and talking about her new book, Busting Breast Cancer. So Susan is here today to bust the myths around breast cancer and what actually causes it. So Susan Wadia Els is a PhD and author of Busting Breast Cancer, Five Simple Steps to Keep Brent's Breast Cancer Out of Your Body. You can find her at www.bustingbreastcancer.com. Susan is a longtime cultural change agent. During the 1970s, she organized women at Polaroid, creating the first affirmative action program for women within a Fortune 200 corporation, and soon became Polaroid's corporate affirmative action manager and a mentor to other national women's groups fighting for equal pay, training, benefits, and career opportunities. She then went on to get a PhD in women's studies and also created the National Feminist Conference, on once ignored or banned topics, including the landmark Women's Ways of Knowing study, exploring the personal growth dimensions within motherhood, women and money, and understanding the power of women's menopausal years. So welcome, Susan. You're an incredible woman. (laughs) Thank you very much, Karen. (laughs) It's a great introduction you did. (laughs) Well, I was reading your bio today and I was like, uh, who knew that you had this history of being such a women's rights activist? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. I love it. It's thanks to you that we are where we are today, right? Just women like you. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're I welcome. still, I think we have a ways to go, but hey. 
I know, I know, I know. But we have we have come a lo a long way. I have some of these funny stories from Polaroid, you know, of uh, being asked very seriously by like the head of security and an ex FBI guy. Susan, we've just hired our first woman security guard. And I'm like, well, good for you. That's wonderful. But I have a big question to ask you, Susan. Well, what would that be? What should she wear, pants or a skirt? And I tried not to laugh. I sat there biting. <laughs> my like, get Su Susan, don't, don't ridicule him. And I quietly said, why don't you ask her what she would like to wear? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Susan, thank you so much. Oh, that's a great <laughs> answer. So yes, oh we have gosh. come a long way. <laughs> what should she wear? Like we would ever ask that for a man, right? <laughs> <laughs> Never. So what made you write this amazing book? I loved your book, by the way. I've already actually a friend of mine, my best friend, just had the exact same experience as I did with her breast, but her, she didn't find a lump, her breast got itchy. So was sent for the mammogram, the ultrasound, the biopsy. And in this whole process, I told her, just get this book. I'm ordering it right now. And she ordered it. And <laughs> she luckily also does not have breast cancer, but it is just, Good. it's a book that we should all be reading because it's about preventing breast cancer. Yes, yes. And it's also, I realize, because I do have a generalist background, I mean, my graduate work is in political economy. I mean, I'm no, I have never been a medical health practitioner of any sort. And, uh, and my PhD is in women's studies. And so the question is, why in the heck would I have ended up writing this book? And it took me like 12 years of doing all this research. Wow. But I had lost so many friends to recurrent metastatic breast cancer. Five, six, or seven. I'm scared to keep counting. Wow. And then two more now are dealing with it. And in each of these cases, they had been told, oh, Jennifer, we we caught it early aren't you the lucky one and then they were treated and then within a few years in one case within a decade they were told they now have recurrent metastatic breast cancer mm. and that's an area that my book touches on very briefly and i really want to begin doing more research on this because all of those it, 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 it's probable that it's 30 to 50% of women who today are being treated by the traditional cancer industry, which we'll talk about as being not the appropriate <laughs> industry no. in most cases to be dealing with breast cancer. They really do not understand the origin of this disease. No. And so what we're looking at, and my book hopefully describes it well, is an unnecessary breast cancer epidemic where tens of thousands of women each year are being overdiagnosed and then overtreated with situations that they in which they're told they have dangerous invasive breast cancer and in fact they do not wow and in some cases the treatment if you follow some of the theories that i describe in my book the treatment is causing either the cancer to become invasive and or the cancer, the localized cancer to become metastatic. And of course, we know that's what kills women. It's not a tumor in your, in your breast. The breast is not a vital organ, except if you're a newborn baby and you're hungry. Mm -hmm. But you know, a breast is not a liver, it's not a lung, it's not a brain. Um, and so, um, the only way you can die from breast cancer is when it moves to another organ that is a vital organ. Okay. Which is good to know. So how is it that treatment makes it, can make it worse? Well, cancer is an inflammatory disease and it's a disease. If you follow the metabolic approach to cancer, which has only been in a textbook form since 2012, and it's wow. still not being taught in medical schools because it will kill the whole profit, mm -hmm. uh, the whole profit model of today's cancer industry. It will destroy it. And so it's going to be a while until the metabolic theory is taught. But um, the, met the, but the, the treatment that they're doing now does nothing but inflame 
the cancerous tumor, beginning, unfortunately, with a mammogram, beginning, unfortunately, with a biopsy. And right, right. Great. Right. Good thing yeah. I did that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and which is why prevention, daily prevention is really critical for each of us. Um, because what we learn in this new metabolic theory is that everyone's first cancer cell or cancer cells begins when our lifestyles, our life habits, our life occurrences suffocate the power battery, suffocate the mitochondria in, in this case, our breast cells. And if we can stop any suffocation of those mitochondria, we will never get cancer. Mm -hmm. And so it's really lovely to understand what an effective prevention step actually is. Because right now, you can talk to friends who have been diagnosed with breast cancer. And of course, one of the first questions they're going to ask their oncologist is, Dr. Jones, why me? Why did I develop breast cancer? And the answer is my understanding. I have never had breast cancer. I, like you, am trying to prevent it. But there are three answers they get. One is, Jennifer, I'm terribly sorry. I guess it was your turn. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, I'm terribly sorry. I guess you were the unlucky one. Jennifer, I'm terribly sorry. Maybe it runs in your family. Those are not causes of breast cancer. And those are the only answers that today's big time oncologists, you can be going to Sloan Kettering, Dana Farber, and those are their answers. They're the only answers they have. So when they go to treat a disease that they don't understand its origin, they probably are not treating it correctly. And so they bring out the tanks and they bring out the barrages of the chemotherapy and the needles to see what the genetic makeup is of the exhaust that the mutate, I call it exhaust. It's the, you know, the new mutations of the cancer cells because they're duplicating mindlessly. They've suffocated. They're not processing oxygen anymore. Instead, they're guzzling glucose. And so when you have a, I love it there, when I lived in Key West for a while, every year they'd have this uh, cancer for kids day. And it was like Charlie and the chocolate factory. And everybody was eating and buying a ton of chocolate to help kids fight cancer. Oh God. Yeah. Okay. So they're giving themselves cancer while they're trying to help right, others. Right. Yeah. So it just says that, you know, that there is no understanding in today's American Cancer Society, the Sloan Ketterings, the, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the Hud Fred Hutchinson, you know, uh, cancer centers, they do not understand the origin of the disease. And so they are not treating it correctly. So that's, that's how, um, you know, that, that unfortunately is how some of the treatments can really, can really harm you. And mm -hmm. the other thing is mammograms. And, and I have a whole chapter, as you know, yep. on why women should never have a mammogram, not a single mammogram. There is no need for a mammogram. It is the most barbaric, ancient, ridiculous, harmful, uh, test, diagnosis, procedure that any woman can undergo. And, and that's because today we have ultrasound. Well, first of all, we have breast self exams and women need to, we used to be taught breast self exams. And now, thanks to the pharmaceutical industry and Susan G. Komen, the American Cancer Society, are telling women never to touch your breasts. They're saying, don't even have a clinical exam. Literally, yes. it's in my book, I've, I've quoted it. <sighs> you want money for your breast cancer clinic. And you want money from Susan G. Komen, which is the biggest funder of all of these breast cancer clinics in the U.S., probably in the world right now. If you mention the term breast self-exam, if you, God will help you if you teach it. If you put it like that's a good thing to do in any of your brochures, you are not given any money. They tell you, do not talk about breast self exams, do not talk about thermography. And the American Cancer Society says, we do not even recommend 
clinical breast exams. They are trying to put fear in women that the only way you can be, quote, safe, Genevieve, is to go have your breasts smashed and let us radiate soft tissue that the, ra the rads stay in the soft tissue. You know, you, you break a bone, they put a metal plate behind your bone and they shoot the x-ray through and it comes out. And they say, you've broken your bone, you haven't, whatever. That's the use of an x-ray. Yeah. Not to shoot rads of, of radiation into the soft tissue where it sits there. And there's one study that shows that women who have followed the American Cancer Society and their oncologists and their insurance companies and every year, every other year, from the time they're 40, they start to have these mammograms. By the time they're 50, they have half as much rads of radiation filling their breasts as a woman who lived half a mile from, from the atomic bomb drop you know, on, you know, in World War II. Wow. Hiroshima. And radiation can cause breast cancer. Radiation so you could get breast cancer from trying to prevent breast cancer. That's right. Exactly. And in fact, a lot of women who have been di overdiagnosed with something called stage zero breast cancer because yeah. of a single mammogram, that is not cancer. That is atypical cells based on inflammation. That is a warning to you to use my five simple steps or figure out ways to get rid of inflammation in your body. Mm -hmm. you know, but instead, the doctors say, oh, Genevieve, you have stage zero breast cancer, but we found it early. You're so lucky. We'll start to treat you. <sighs> and the first thing they do is they stick a biopsy into where those atypical cells are, inflaming it which can increase the inflammation, can increase the suffocation, can initiate actual breast cancer. So, I mean, every, every path you go down illustrates that the cancer industry today doesn't have a clue. Oh my God. So, how... But that's not what I had, right? Like my, my, was mine, would that have been considered as double zero or whatever you called it? The no, atypical. No, 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 no. Okay. Okay. No, I was just no, no. thought maybe because no, when I read that in your book, I was like, is that what I had or, no, <laughs> and I no, just irritated it with my <laughs> called DCIS ductal carcinoma in situ. Um, but it had the term carcinoma, which makes no sense. There was a big blue ribbon panel in the early eighties in Washington that said we should not want, no longer call it DCIS because it has the term carcinoma. It's mm -hmm. not cancer. Mm -hmm. They said instead we should call it just atypical cells. Well, they never, the government, whatever, the National Cancer Institute never adopted that, that, um, you know, that, that goal, that recommendation. Mm -hmm. Instead, they've now moved and they call it stage zero breast cancer. And they have women have double mastectomies sometimes. You know, I mean, in <sighs> this case with breast cancer, you're better off if you don't have good insurance. Right. Because then they can't go after you with such vehemence. Um, you're much better to do watch and wait and get rid of your inflammation. Yeah. And that's where my book can be very helpful. You know, uh -huh. the five simple steps they, it really helps women get back to a safe space. And yeah. three quarters of American women today are not in a safe space because of what they've done to their body and what the society has done to their body. Oh, I know. Yeah. Let's, let's go back a little bit. Cause we touched on a little bit on, or you touched a little bit on the, that it's a metabolic disease. And I, I just want you to explain that. Like why is it that it's metabolic and what do you mean by that? Okay, good question. So the, the, the first cancer cells, and it isn't just breast cancer, all mm -hmm. cancer is the same. Okay. All cancer starts because our lifestyles, our bodies are not able to process oxygen anymore into some of the cells that for whatever reason they have suffocated. And with breast cancer, it, it's usually too much radiation, 
<laughs> from mammograms or, you know, the, the airline stewardesses get radiation up there in the air, you know, it's a, um, but, but, or with so many American women, it's obesity that suffocates their breast cells because, and this is your topic, when you are obese, you are manufacturing, you're an estrogen production operation 24-7. Yeah. Your fat cells become the largest endocrine organ in your body. And those guys, those guys are really active 24-7 while you sleep, while you're awake, they are manufacturing estrogen and kicking you off balance. So you have depression, not, I mean, you're overweight, yeah, but you also have depression and you're starving and you're, you're just metabolically messed up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, postmenopausally, 30% risk, your, your risk for breast cancer increase at least 30%, if not more. Just because, and we're not just talking obese, we're talking overweight. We're mm -hmm. talking 15 pounds and more overweight, mm -hmm. which is probably 80% of women in the United States today. Mm -hmm. And and it's worse for postmenopausal, but for the premenopausal women, as soon as they become menopausal, they join the crowd. But but if they develop breast cancer before they are postmenopausal, their ability to deal effectively with any treatment that's given them is really bad, really lousy. Their, mm -hmm. their, their rate of mortality is much greater than a woman of healthy weight who's premenopausal. Wow. So, and, and they have the inclination to develop what we call a mature type of breast cancer, that there are three general types of breast cancer as identified by what the mutations look like. There's the estrogen positive, which can be slow growing, especially if you're postmenopausal, but then there's the triple negative and the HER2 positive. And that, those two, especially if you're premenopausal and you develop those, they can develop very rapidly. And if you are obese, you are your prognosis is very, very, very poor mm -hmm. uh, compared to a healthy uh, mm -hmm. person. Now, of course, there's all these exceptions. But anyway, the metabolic theory, as you've asked, is so when your inflammation in your body because of X, Y, and Z is suffocating those cells, that's when the might and your immune system is weak. So your vitamin D3 blood level is in the cellar. It's below, well, you've never had a woman develop breast cancer. These studies will set, tell you. Yeah, this was crazy. <laughs> this was a crazy stat. I've been telling people this. So yes, go yeah, ahead. Sorry. And it's the easiest way to prevent breast cancer. Yes, yes. 60 is your magic number. Yeah. And I tell women once they're over 60, keep your D3 level at your age. Unless you hit, you go over a hundred. Then once you hit a hundred, you don't have to have it at a hundred. That's a bit high. But you know, if you're 70, see if you can get to 70. It's difficult. It's very difficult because as you get older, it's harder to either metabolize the D3 supplements or to take in enough sunshine to metabolize your chlorocalcerol or whatever they call it to make the D3. Um, but you need to work hard. And, and that's why I recommend indoor tanning for those of us in you know, the Northwest and the New England, et cetera, because we don't get much sun in most months of the year. And even then we sometimes don't get a lot of sun. So it's really important to keep a good tan going because if you've got a really strong immune system, which is, and I like to call, D3 is kind of like the electricity or, or the rate of our internet, our internal internet. And if we have lousy internet, we have low D3, we have lousy internet. Once our cells in the breast start to suffocate, they're gonna call out to our immune system, hey, please help me, I'm suffocating, help me you know, destroy myself, which is what all cells do when they get sick, they destroy themselves. They call it apoptosis, pop goes the weasel, I call it. And, but if, you're, if your internet's down, well, because your D3 is down, your, your immune system sits there and can't help you. So you then develop some breast cancer. Now the genetic people won't tell you that, the cancer industry today 
they'll say, maybe Jennifer, you were the unlucky one. They don't know what I just told you. Yeah. So what's the, you didn't actually say the studies, the studies show that levels of D3, vitamin D, you guys, vitamin D, if it's over, there's been no cases. Is that, is that right? That's what one of these studies by Cedric Garland, who's a big deal in San Diego. He's like one of the top three that I talk about in my chapter on D3. He's been at this his whole life and he's in probably 75 right now. Yeah. He can't find any woman ever diagnosed. That's great. Breast cancer who has a blood level of D3 that is over 60. That's kind of like an ironclad, you know, I'm sure there's got to be somebody, but he hasn't ever found them. So that is the easiest of my five simple steps. That mm -hmm. is the easiest, just whatever it takes. And don't be afraid of indoor tanning. The dermatologists of the world will say, no, Matilda, no, no, Jennifer, no, no, no. But then they have tanning machines in their offices they call it photovoltaics or something i don't know they call it pho photo something or other and and they use it for psoriasis you know all of these skin conditions and stuff they put you under sun lamps and then they charge your insurance 300 bucks whereas you can go to your local tanning salon i go in i, I do a stand-up tanning stall couple yeah. times a week. Isn't some of you, know, you have to be very specific about finding the right tanning bed because some of them will only have certain UV rays in them. They won't have a full well, spectrum. Everybody, everything always has many more UVA than UVB, you know, okay. rays or whatever. But, um, and I don't like this tanning thing to come down on me, whatever. I mean, I like just to go into the tanning stall. You're there a max of seven minutes. You know, you slather yourself with, with coconut oil or something, right? No, no sunscreen. You're no trying sunscreen. to get sunscreen. And you walk around, you look good. You got a decent tan all year <laughs> round, you know? And, <laughs> yeah, and true. And your D3 is over 60. So you're like, it's a win win operation. Yeah. And we are in an epidemic of low D3. Like, I can't tell you how often every day I'm looking at labs that are telling me that some woman's got low D3 and sometimes really low D3. And there can even be a genetic component where you have a certain gene where you don't take in vitamin D very well and you have to supplement for the rest of your life. I talked to this autoimmune specialist who talked about that and she said, you should yes. find out if you've got that genetic predisposition for that. She had it and she has to take it for the rest of her life because it's so important for the immune system. Well, we all have to take it for the rest of our life unless yeah. we're living in Tahiti. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's true. Uh, I mean, literally, I don't know how you keep it up there without taking D3. And then the problem is most doctors don't get it because the National Cancer Institute, the National Institutes of Health, they're not pushing it because no. that these groups are all, con we don't have a government now. Our, our US government, unfortunately, is being run by pharmaceutical, yep. medical, chemical, you know, high tech companies and they're interested in making money and the medical people, um, they will not look, I mean, they're controlled by the pharmaceutical industry and they will not yeah. look at prevention. No, they will no. not. And so they will say there is no connection between breast cancer and low D3. No. And they're very selective at what they look at and they make sure they only look at studies and, and my book, you know, has gone it, it must have thousands of citations yeah and what does, i did yeah. was i found studies that people have ignored like crazy yeah um, nothing's being pulled out of your ass out of it in this book like you have you've cite, cited everything that you've put in yes there, which is amazing yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah yes yes well i mean i am an investigative reporter it's yeah. not like i have any medical opinion on anything because i don't have any you know instruction knowledge clinical experience, not. Um, so I was, and in fact, as I said to Dr. Mercola, I hadn't, haven't had a, a television in 50 years. Wow. And he went a little berserk about that, but it meant that I didn't, I wasn't brainwashed about pink ribbons and Susan G. Komen and running for the cure and believing in anything, you know? So I went in there with a tabla rasa 
and started looking at the research. And, and my book is the result of clear, you know, clear headed research. Yeah. And um, so, so there we are. So, so that's the metabolic and, and just to finish up on the metabolic theory. So what happens is when that cancer cell starts to suffocate, if it cannot connect with the immune system, it then, it then connects with the nucleus in the cell and says, start to duplicate. Okay, that's where the the medical industry will say it's the oncogene and the you know and the and and that so it's so the the cell begins to duplicate uncontrollably, and really what's happened is the mitochondria before it became part of us mammal are the cells in us mammals, it was a single cell bacteria in prehistoric time, and all it knew how to do was guzzle up the glucose, because there wasn't enough oxygen in the atmosphere in prehistoric time to process oxygen like we have today. They only had glucose. So they would process the glucose and they would be like a compost heap and they duplicate themselves and make a tumor, make a compost heap. And that's all a tumor is. It's an uncontrolled cell duplicating itself being run by that fermenting power battery, that mitochondria that is in our mammal cells now, but used to be in prehistoric time all by itself, just duplicating. Yeah. And so at that point, the question is, well, how do you stop it? How do you stop it from mindlessly duplicating? Well, if you want to make a bigger compost heap, what do you do to that compost heap? You take the garbage, from your kitchen and you walk it out to the compost heap and you dump it on. And what is that garbage? Glucose, yeah. it's glucose. You're not taking your lamb chops out there necessarily. You're taking, you know, your stale bread. You know, you're taking your pea pods, you're taking your glucose and you're feeding your compost heap and it's getting bigger. So that people who are eating glucose and they have a cancer cell, they're making it Thrive. Yes. You know, so when, when the oncologists at the big cancer center say, oh, Genevieve, go eat whatever you need. We don't want you to lose weight. Oh, mama. Yeah. You know, they don't understand the origin or the nature of the disease they're treating. And it's not their fault. The medical schools are not teaching people the metabolic theory yet because the medical schools get so much money from the pharmaceutical companies, the pharmaceutical companies have control over what the curricula is. Yeah. And it's just like the National Cancer Institute where all of this research, billions of dollars of research, none of it is allowed to go to metabolic research. It only can go to the cancer center research. You have to say first off, Cancer is a genetic disease. They, I mean, I say, I equate it to the cancer industry today really believes the earth is flat. Right. And if you don't think the earth is flat, you don't get any money. And, and their, their current head, well, I don't know who the current head, I have to check under Biden, but under, under Trump, the, the head of the National Cancer Institute was a guy who used to run the Linebrook Cancer Center, University of North Carolina. Before that, it was the guy who used to, under Obama, I think it was the guy who used to run the, the not Dana-Farber, but um, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. So the people running the major cancer clinics then become the people running the National Cancer Institute. So why would they allow metabolic? Yeah. Oh, there's no money in that. <laughs> no, no, no. They would kill their stock, you know, their stock ownership and all of that would, you know, it would, it would just die, wither away and yeah. die. <laughs> so, so it is a, a nasty situation. Yeah. As cancer increases in this country, and, and, and we're still trying to you know, deal with the war on cancer and people keep throwing more money at it to do nothing, but maybe to help people live lousy quality of lives longer. 
Yeah. Yeah. Where is, where are we today with breast cancer research? Because, you know, like you said, the pink ribbons, the running for breast cancer, you're asked constantly, donate your money to breast cancer research. And I always say no, because my understanding is there has been zero advancements in breast cancer. There's no reduction of cases. There's only an increase. There is. And, and the scary thing is, and again, I need to do more research on this. I talk about it a little in the book is that right now the state cancer uh, boards are not releasing their annual numbers on how many women are being diagnosed every year in Utah, Iowa, Rhode Island, California with recurrent metastatic breast cancer. And those state boards, they know the exact number and they are not apparently allowed by the people who fund them, which is either the National Cancer Institute and or the Centers for Disease Control. They don't, they don't operate, as I understand it, from many state funds, if any. They, they operate strictly from federal funds. So if they go against the feds, they lose their budgets, their jobs, the whole shebang. But every doctor, if she or he want to keep their state medical licensing, they have to report. And I show the page, the the, the, you know, the citation is very specific in chapter nine in my book. They have to report within six months of diagnosing a woman with recurrent metastatic breast cancer. They have to report her age. They have to report how long it was since she was initially treated. They have to report where the metastasis has happened. Is it the brain? Is it the bone? Is it the liver? Is it all three? They have specific, and what kind, you know, what kind of original cancer was it? Because that's the kind of cancer that is now metastasized. Mm -hmm. so all of that very specific data is being counted every day by every state cancer board, and they never release it to the public. <gasps> Terrible. And and I believe one of the reasons that's happening is if you now look at the drug income for breast cancer, more than 50% of all breast cancer drug income is coming from, re, from metastatic breast cancer drugs. So their big deal is if you pay us 130,000 this year, Jennifer, or if your insurance does, or if your you know, mortgage does or whatever, you know, we'll keep you alive X more months. Mm. And I, you know, I'm hoping with some women, it's a decent quality of life. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, with others, I have to believe it's not very decent. But, but life is important to each of us. And, and so people will, will women end up bankrupt, their families end up bankrupt as they die having lived for X years with metastatic breast cancer and 98%, 95, 98 is recurrent. They were successfully treated, quote unquote, mm -hmm. but yet they then developed the, the metastatic breast right. cancer. I wish somebody would do a run or a, some sort of fundraiser for women with breast cancer that just gives them money, not to breast cancer research, but here, make your quality of life better. Here's money for your treatment. Here's money for supporting your family so you can not work. Here's money for getting alternative treatments, buying healthy food so that you can reverse your metabolic cancer <laughs> because we know it's expensive. That's what I would love to see. And that's what I would love to give my money to. Right. Well, there, there, I remember living in Key West, there was a, a local fund and they would pay, help you with your rent. They would help you exactly what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. You know, um, and, uh, and, and that was incredibly helpful. So I think there's some of those funds out there, but not near enough. Not enough. No, I don't ever hear about them. Medicare for all. I mean, yeah. I mean you know, I mean, yeah, it was funny. I ran into a girlfriend at grocery shopping yesterday and we got talking about COVID because we were some of the few people that weren't wearing our masks in there. And she was talking about vaccines. And then we got into the conversation of natural treatments versus the vaccine. And 
I was telling her that, oh, no, there is like, there's a lot of natural treatments out there for COVID. And she said, yeah, but what they obviously don't work or why wouldn't the government be for that? Like, why wouldn't the government be for having, you know, vitamin C and ivermectin and all of these other treatments if it worked? And I'm like, okay, listen up here, girl. Do you know that the government makes trillions of dollars from vaccines <laughs> well the government from pharmaceutical the government, companies. The government's giving the the pharmaceutical industry trillions of dollars and they're the same people that that's what we have a hard time recognizing and if people yeah. will stop listening to msnbc and see these what is it, <laughs> cnn yeah so, i mean they're completely run by the corporations they're not giving us news that Dark Horse, it's a new, that's one I've really come to like. Uh, it's, it's on YouTube and then they censor them on YouTube. So then they've gone to, I think, Odyssey, uh, Red Rockfin. I mean, even YouTube now is doing huge censoring. So Oh, huge. Yeah. And I was telling her that she had no idea. I'm like, no, no, they pulled it. I was listening. I interviewed Dr. Brownstein and he was threatened because he put on his site that he could treat people with COVID and not saying he was curing it, just treat people with vitamin C and blah, 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 IVs. And he was threatened that his entire business was going to get shut down if he didn't take that off his website. Exactly. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. No, we're Major not censorship. On time at all right now. No. And, and what I say in my book is individual women taking charge of our own bodies not being run by the fear mongering that's being shoved at us by Susan G. Komen, American Cancer Society, our OBGYNs, you know, our oncologists, that women thinking for themselves, taking care of themselves as a group, we are the only group that has both the self-interest and now we, hopefully with my book, the knowledge to end this unnecessary breast cancer epidemic. Absolutely. But unless women get rid of their fear, and I always also talk in chapter two about why women have a much tougher time, like your friend, questioning authority than men. And yeah. I always love to use, you know, and 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 it's a, it's described to us, there's a biological, a cultural biological reason for that. I would say it's a cultural one based on how girls are raised versus how boys are raised. And it's described by Jean Baker Miller, and I quote her in chapter two in my book about where that comes from. And Carol Gilligan talks about it. And this all came out of the 70s with the feminist psychology that began then. And, and you know, you just think about you know, a group of 14 year olds about to someone challenges everybody to jump over the mud puddle. Well, the boys are in the air, boom, 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 boom. And some of them make it, some of them don't. What do they care? The girls are standing there going, I don't have the right shoes on. Yeah. I might not make it. I don't think so. I couldn't do that. You know, and like, why? What's the difference? And there is a psychological reason that has to do with how when our mothers kicked us into the shower with daddy versus sticking with mommy be a big boy like daddy so you're no longer part of mommy big boy but the little girl jenny stays with mommy and so jenny keeps mommy's cautiousness in her brain and bobby has totally forgotten it he is so apart from that cautiousness because he was already told as a two-year-old, go take a shower, be a big boy like daddy. Yep. Janie was not sent to take a big boy like daddy shower. She was stayed with mommy. And it's something as simple as that, mm -hmm. that women get stuck with. We have that voice that mm -hmm. boys don't have. Like, I really just want to go to the beach now. The sun is gorgeous. Do the dishes first, says the voice. I don't want to do the dishes now. I want to go out. No, no, you have to do the dishes first. This voice in our head, it's not our voice. The boys don't have the voice. They just go out. They don't the hell with the dishes, you know? But, it, but, but, but that's how the cancer industry can get women, 70% of women, to take a damn mammogram every year. Oh, I know. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, women are like, oh, I have to, I have to. I... No, you don't. 
You well, are- now in the defense of men, they do have to have a finger in their bum once a year. Once they, they do have to have a finger in the bum once a year to check their prostate. So, oh. <laughs> well, you know, that's the one thing that they have to do like, compared to what women have to go through in their lifetime between the birthing of children and their periods and menopause and breast cancer. You, those guys can handle a finger in the bum. <laughs> Women have to, I mean, it's amazing how many women never touch their breasts. Oh, I know. And they yeah. encase them. I mean, for some reason, and, and you or I, somebody needs to start talking about nipples. Yeah. Why are nipples so verboten? Why are women so afraid to show nipples? I mean, in the 70s, everybody, nobody wore bras, you know, it was just like, relax. All of a sudden, you're not allowed to show a nipple. Mm-hmm. And, and you're not allowed to have just a simple cloth bra. You have to have these kind of pieces of armor, right? And that helps suffocate mitochondria, keeps everything warm and, and tight in. And it's like, what is going on? I know. I had this woman once as a client and she, when I did body work and she was probably in her late 60s and she never wore a bra and her breasts hung right down to her belly button. And I just was like, that is, I am going to do that. Like how liberating that you just, I want to get to that point and I know I should do it now, but <laughs> let the breasts hang out. I, I am 100% in favor of that. I mean, and what's the problem? You know, I, I mean, know. if you're uncomfortable with it, fine, then deal with it. But you don't need to have these massive cases thick in case. Oh, I haven't worn a normal bra in probably over five years. No. And I'm getting more and more comfortable. <laughs> I'm, I'm in the search of like, how, how much less can I have for support and still, you know, not, you still right. be somewhat secured. <laughs> right. But it's really, it's, I've found that it's almost impossible to find bras that don't have underwires and don't have any kind of padding or any kind of, you know, form. It's almost impossible to find those bras and that aren't massively elastic to like smash you. Yeah. You know, the sports bra that boom, flattens you, you know, Uh, it's hard. Someone should contact all of us and tell us where we get those bras. I think we should just create some sort of garment for men's penises and balls that shove their balls up around their penis so they come out of their pants and that's going to be the new trend is showing off the cleavage of your balls and we'll see how you like it (laughs) this season we'll get on that (laughs) okay so tell us about our five simple lifestyle steps or changes that can help a woman (laughs) <laughs> okay, I'm going to be real quick with it, and we can go into any detail after I do the list if we want to. Yes. First yeah. is, and it's so important, is to lose your excess body fat. And of course, I recommend that the most fun and easiest way of doing it and the healthiest is to go ketogenic. And that includes, you know, that's a low carb, high fat diet. And, which, and the joy of that is you get so full so fast. You know, just think, you know, so, so that's the first figure out a way to lose your excess body fat. And even after you lose your excess body fat, stick with your low carb, high fat diet, at least, you know, one or two weeks every month, because you really want to get your body to be manufacturing these ketones from your liver and fueling all of your cells with the ketones and not with glucose. And, and, and to go along with that is you eat one or two meals a day and or you do the intermittent fasting. You're just not hungry. When you're on a low carb, high fat diet, it changes everything. Mm-hmm. You don't have the kind of hunger that you have when you're eating the inefficient, dirty fuel called glucose. So every woman who gets up and has oatmeal and a banana is wrecking her whole day. Yes. And you're yeah. going to be, we're going to be burned at the stake for that. Anytime you mention oatmeal, it, it's like, 
Susan. You, I, I get death threats when I tell people not to eat oatmeal for right. breakfast. They're like, I can't live without my granola and banana. <laughs> How right? dare you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the second is, of course, to avoid all progestin drugs. And you, again, know more about this than I do in many ways, especially the birth control drugs, the progestin-laced IUDs, and when you're menopausal and you're looking for, quote, relief from PMS or, or yeah. depression or anxiety or whatever's going on with you. And so that's um, progestin, everybody, not progestin, progesterone. Not right. Bioidentical progesterone has been shown to help prevent breast right. cancer. Progestin right. is the synthetic form of progesterone. It's in birth control pills. It's in the Mirena IUD. Everybody listen to that. Everybody has been told by their doctor, oh, there's hardly any hormones in your IUD, but it's progestin. And yes, there is. And it's going straight into your uterus. So there is a ton now of information about the deadly effects right. of progestin. Well, the progestin is not just going into your uterus, it's going, it's going into, into your breast system. cells. It is creating breast cancer, you know, and the most horrific, oh, let me go through the others, then we'll yeah. get back yeah. to this. And the third is to have an annual a thermogram. And you're having an annual thermogram not to see if you have breast cancer yet. You don't have a thermogram to see if you have breast cancer yet. You do a thermogram to see are my, is my breast tissue inflamed? Do I need to get cracking and lose the weight, you know, lower, you know, get my hormones in balance, um, clean out my body and stop using, you know, gunky cosmetics and filter my water and get rid of the inflammation. What is causing my, because that's step number one to getting breast cancer. So if you don't know the health of your breast tissue, because you haven't been having an annual thermogram, you're nuts. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Now, again, the problem is the insurance companies still will not cover thermography, most of them. Mem Medicare won't because they're all in bed with the mammogram companies and they want you to go have a mammogram so they can diagnose you or overdiagnose you with cancer and then get your money that way. I mean, it's a disgusting situation we live in right now. Okay, that's three. The, four is, the fourth is, again, you know a lot about this, is to keep your body cleansed of, of the too much of one hormone versus another, keep them balanced and to get all of the uh, the toxic types of hormonal chemicals out of our bodies, um, the pesticides yeah. and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. And also the most important, I think, is to figure out a way to get rid of the stress mm -hmm. that for some reason, breast cancer more than any other cancer I have understood will be caused by the suffocation of the breast cells can happen very easily from the high stress. And so that's why women who are wealthy and women who are very poor will end up with a whole lot of breast cancer. Yeah. Because when they're very wealthy, they're so worried about everything in the world and based on their money and blah, 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 blah. And when they don't have enough money, they're very worried about their survival. Mm -hmm. And those two entities bring on cancer so much more in the very wealthy and in the very poor. And the more you can do an hour a day of whatever meditation works, if it's just sitting and watching your breath, if it's swimming, if it's yoga, whatever works, find what works for you. Yeah. And get that cortisol lowered every day for at least a couple of hours. And that is a detoxification method that is so effective yeah. because that also apparently the high cortisol knocks up your glucose levels and you're feeding cancer cells with glucose. Yeah. So that's why the de-stress thing is critical. And then the fifth, of course, we've talked about is the D3, which is the easiest. Yeah. That's the easiest. Use your indoor tanning, your outdoor tanning, relax, 
you know, look good, get that tan going. And, and especially for people with dark skin. And they, if, if people with darker skin live in the North, this is not genetically where they were supposed to be living. I mean, my son was born in Calcutta, India. He, oh, you know, uh, he, was in there. he was three years old, right? And the poor guy has lived either in Vermont or in Massachusetts most of his life. He did live in Key West for a while, but it's mainly Massachusetts and Vermont. And he's a computer nut. So he's not doing a marathon out there in, in short shorts. And so he once had a D3 of nine. That's rickets. Wow. So weak bones, weak muscle, depression, exhaustion, not good, not good. Um, so women who are African-American, Asian, Indian, Caribbean, in West Indian, and if they're living outside of where their ancestors, you know, inhabited, they really need to worry about their D3 levels and have the D3 monitored, measured twice a year, summer and winter, because it can change dramatically and figure out how to raise it. And it means five, 10, 15,000 IUs a day sometimes yep. with, with K2 apparently, yep. with a calcium magnesium. Uh, there, Dr. Mercola is very good at describing, you know, the best way of taking your D3 and how much to take. Grassroots health. Again, I talk about grassroots health a lot in my book. They're an amazing organization out of San Diego, about 12 years old, and they have done more to educate the world on the importance of D3 and how mm -hmm. to do that mm -hmm. uh, than really any, any entity. They're excellent. Yeah, and so those are the five. Those are the five simple great. steps. Simple, yeah, exactly. You know, don't you wonder what are we doing right now with you go to a park right now with a kid when you know when I go with my when my kids were little, you'd go to the park and there'd be hundreds of kids running around and they would be covered head to toe in white, thick sunscreen. You can see these women with their spray guns of sunblock all over their kids and then plus the kids have on their swim shirts and like god forbid their hat their sun hats they don't want their kid to get a lick of sunshine and i'm like what you guys don't even know what you're doing to the health of your child and this is nine i would say 95 percent of people do this with their kids right now and i'm just like oh what are we doing right. my kids never have worn sunblock and exactly. they never burn which is interesting Oh, they, yeah, they've developed, you, you put a shirt on them when they start to burn, exactly. you know, or go under That's the umbrella do. or get out of the sun. But, you know, um, but there's a very interesting chart. I think it came from the state of Connecticut in my book. It shows as the, um, the strength of sunblock increased, was introduced in the 70s, 80s, etc. the amount of melanoma increased at the same rate because it turns out that melanoma is not like this um uh the 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 regular skin cancers of the basal and the squamous the basal and the squamous go see your dermatologist twice a year and they can burn off cut off if you get the little lesions they're not gonna 99% of the time, they'll never metastasize and kill you, you know, and you can see them, get rid of them, done. But the melanoma, that is a different disease. That is a real cancer. That will kill you, but it's only 1% of all skin cancers, but still it's 1%. But the rates have gone up at the same rate as the sales of heavy sunscreens. Interesting. Okay, just like the birth control drugs, I have that graph too. As birth control drugs, thanks to good old President Clinton, was allowed to, they, you were allowed to advertise them on television. He, he lowered the regulation. So all pharmaceutical drugs could now be put on the television. You could sell it to the consumer, not to the doctor. So as birth control drugs became these lifestyle drugs, Genevieve needs to buy this one versus that one. That's when you saw women under 50, premenopausal women, the rate of breast cancer went up at the same rate. 
Wow. And the other thing we find is that U.S. women of, of childbearing age are about, what, 4.5% of the world's population, because the U.S. is maybe 4% of the world's population. But U.S. women pay 47% of the income that the worldwide birth control market takes in. 47% of that income comes from U.S. women. Oh my gosh. So that's why U.S. women, that's one of the reasons we have the highest breast cancer rate, hands down, of premenopausal women worldwide. And the highest obesity rates too, right? Highest obesity, that's right. But, but, but if you are less than 50 years old, your risk of getting, and you live in the U.S., your risk of getting breast cancer is almost double. It's more than double what it is if you live in Poland or other Eastern European countries of any age, of any age. Yeah. So, so the best thing to do to avoid breast cancer is move out of the United States. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Literally, that is the best thing you can do. Get yeah. out of the U.S. It will lower your rate of breast cancer tremendously. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that's a real sick situation. Yeah. Yeah. And now you're a big proponent too of testing with the Dutch urine hormone test, correct? Say this again. Um, for when it comes to testing the hormones and the, you like to test the, by Dutch, by urine hormone testing to see how we are metabolizing our hormones, which can show whether or not you might be going down a more inflammatory estrogenic pathway than the other healthy estrogen pathways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it turns out that a lot of women who are diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer, um, they have a very hard time eliminating, urinating their used up toxic estrogen. So they have a much harder time balancing their hormones. And that can be shown in an estrogen metabolite test. Mm -hmm. And then I guess there are ways that you can encourage that estrogen, that, you know, toxic estrogen to be eliminated. And again, that goes into your field. Mm -hmm. But the important thing is to have an estrogen metabolite test to, to illustrate to you if you're being efficient in your metabolism and your elimination of that excess estrogen. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I should probably clarify too, when we were talking earlier about estrogens, it is when you gain fat, then your body is going to produce more of estrone. So your fat cells produce estrone, which is a more inflammatory estrogen. And we become estrone dominant when we are in menopause because we lose our estriol, we lose our estradiol, the other two estrogens, and we become more estrone dominant, which can then cause inflammation and it'll go to breast tissue and make those breast cancer cells grow because it's so inflammatory. If you look at the statistics of who's getting breast cancer the most, it is postmenopausal women. Correct? Well, yes, but and the the real time to be really worried is when you're making that transition that you just described so beautifully when you start making more of that estrone and less of the estradiol, et cetera, because as you say, it's more inflammatory. And so if you can get through your forties, if you can get to menopause and have avoided breast cancer, you have avoided that inflammatory level that suffocated your breast cells. And then, you know, it's not to say that once you're postmenopausal women don't get breast cancer, but my sense is when they do, it's often the estrogen positive, which is a slow grower. And often we didn't talk about when you're taking, having a mammogram, it turns out 40% of women who are told from the mammogram, not, they can't feel anything from the mammogram that they have either stage zero or stage one breast cancer. That's 40% of women who are told from the mammogram that they have can breast cancer. Those women should be ignored. They should do watch and wait. Well, the, everybody should 
do the five simple steps and get rid of their inflammation. Yeah. But, but you shouldn't let anybody biopsy any type of little tumor you can't even feel. It, it's like as, as, as Dr. Seifried, who wrote the textbook on the metabolic theory back in 2012, and he wrote a beautiful forward to my book, he describes a biopsy needle as sticking a beehive. Oh, a no. Okay. And then what happens, and I describe this in chapter one, it's called the seed and soil theory, and it was developed in the 1890s, and it's been smothered. People, the industry, cancer industry doesn't want to know about this. They don't teach it. Most oncologists have never heard about it, but it is explaining why we have so much recurrent metastatic breast cancer today because the cancer industry in the U.S. especially, they are biopsy happy. That's $7,000 every biopsy. They love to charge. They love to give women biopsies. $7,000. Ching, ching. No oh, watching. Thank God I live in Canada. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. And and so, but but what happens apparently is if you poke that beehive with the hat pin, and out pops, and apparently cancer cells are not closely connected like our healthy cells; they're loosely connected. So one pops out with that needle. And then what happens is the macrophage, which is the strongest immune cell in our body, comes screaming in to help heal the wound that the oncologist, the surgeon just created with their biopsy. And that macrophage has the ability to fuse with that loose cancer cell. And the macrophage can heal burns, it can heal broken bones, it can go anywhere in the body. So it takes off into the body. And it apparently likes to lodge in the liver, the bone, and the brain. And that's where most metastatic, recurrent metastatic breast cancer occurs. Oh, so oh. that is how the treatment is increasing the metastatic. And that's where they're making more than 50% today of their income from breast cancer drugs. Right. So it, it behooves the industry to biopsy you, get recurrent metastatic breast cancer going, and then save you by keeping you alive for three, five, 12 years with all of their chemicals. Yeah. Wow. Well, Susan, oh, you guys read her book. All of you women do yourselves a favor because this is like I said, I had a rude awakening because I never looked into it. I never thought it would happen to me. And that was just, it was meant to happen that I think I needed to get into that and really understand breast cancer more. So, and like you said, Susan, this isn't just about breast cancer. It's about cancer. So it's about how to save yourself from cancer in general. So exactly. I, yeah, exactly. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Susan, for coming on the show. I really appreciate this enlightening conversation. Well, thanks, Karen. I, I love this uh, opportunity, and um, and I hope I haven't been too uh, scary, you know, for, oh, for it's women. Wonderful. No, no, it's good. I love your passion about it. <laughs> <laughs> but we really just do need to understand that the authorities out there are not on our side. No. Yeah. It's yeah. really hard, really hard for women, especially, to believe, understand. Yeah. Especially if they've been mistreated thus far by the industry. Yeah. And, and, and they feel like they're safe right now. Then they can be very angry at the messenger. And in this case, it's this book, Busting Breast Cancer, it becomes the messenger. So yeah. we have to understand that and, and be compassionate and, and hope for the best.